the sixth meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, obviously, due to ongoing COVID-19 safeguarding measures, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference, and our witnesses will also be <coughs> briefing us via video conference. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live, but it will end at 12 noon. That is, the broadcast will end at 12 noon, even if our meeting continues. Um, it's regrettable, but cannot be avoided due to limited assembly resources. Um, a recording of the meeting up to 12 noon will be made available on the committee's web pages on the assembly website following the meeting. Just to remind members to mute their tablets by pushing F4. Um, <laughs> So, moving on then to item number one, apologies. We have apologies from Stuart Dixon due to ongoing illness, and also this morning from John Stewart. I don't think there's everybody else. Nope, everybody else is here, Chair. Um, John. Item number two then is our draft minutes. There is a copy of those at um, page five of your pack from the meeting held on the 24th of June. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection? Great. Okay, then um, item number three, chairperson's business. We have no business this morning. No items, sir. Sure. Um, so moving on then to item number four is our oral briefing by Starley from departmental officials on Brexit. Um, there is, is our... Our officials are there. There's four officials, here. yeah. Great. Um, so there is a clerk's memo at page 13 of your pack. There is a briefing paper from the Assembly's EU Affairs Manager at page 18. There is a briefing paper from Derry Chamber of Commerce in relation to the EU exit transition period at page 41. And there is a paper from the EU Affairs Manager at page 3 of your table papers. So when you announce the official, if you just say, can I bring into the spotlight? Okay. Will they all come into the spotlight? They will all be brought into the spotlight then, yeah. Okay, so we have four officials with us this morning um, from the um, EU Exit Preparation and Transition Group, and I'm going to ask to bring into the spotlight Paul, Mary, Julia, and Victor, please. And magically they will appear. There we go. There they are. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to invite the officials then to, to make an opening statement, and then we'll open it up to members. So um, obviously we had a, an informal briefing from um, Paul on the. 18th of June, yes, um, so I, I suppose it will just be some update of what we had since then. Yes, we can, thanks. Yeah, okay, okay, so, um, thanks very much. Paul Brokart, so I, I head up the um, transition, uh, exit transition group, so I'm joined by uh, Julia, who leads the protocol, Victor, who heads up our trade and migration, and then Mary, who leads on uh, legislation and our readiness. So I'll provide you um, a, just a, an overview across the three divisions of the group, and then uh, um, rather than individual presentations from the guys, we'll, we'll open to questions um, from members. So I think that Paul, can the biggest change since we... Uh, can I just oh, interrupt you a wee second? It's a little bit low this morning, so we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. I think we're going to try and No, no, it's not that. It it's done from downstairs. So we're just asking um, broadcasting to turn maximise it up a bit. their volume. And Paul, if you just speak very loud too, that would really help. Uh, okay, is that a little clearer? It's a bit better. We're, we're still working on that. Get you need to let them know downstairs. Thank you, Tom. Okay, do you want me to try and carry on or it's a bit pause yeah, it's a bit technical better. issues? Yeah. No, if you want to go, go on ahead, go on ahead. just be um, very loud, Paul. Speak loudly. <laughs> How technical are we? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Uh, so the, the biggest change I think, since we last provided a um, a briefing to you, in fact, it was on, on the day that we were in front of the committee, the UK government published its command paper. Um, so that, uh, I'm sure members will have had a chance to read it, but we can just qu to quickly run through the, the issues. Um, I guess the summary would be there's uh, good news and also some uh, remaining uncertainty uh, in the paper. Uh, our minister uh, welcomed the commitments from UK government on unfettered access. Um, I think that was positive to see that. We're keen to see more detail on how that will be delivered. The command paper also included more detail for the first time that import declarations will be required for businesses purchasing goods from GB. Um, you know, while that in itself is positive that we're getting that clarity, that raises a concern about uh, the capacity and capability of our businesses 
um, to complete those uh, declaration forms. And, and you know, we've previously discussed the particularly low preparedness levels amongst our SME populations, which, given the nature of our economy as an SME economy, is is a, a key concern. There, there also remains um, uh, uh, a, a question, uh, uh, a lack of detail around tariffs and in particular um, goods which are considered to be at risk uh, within the uh, terms of the protocol. Um, that is still to be uh, discussed between the UK and the EU within the joint committee structures. Um, so we continue to monitor that very closely. Uh, and also, there are issues around the implementation of the protocol, so that don't require a negotiation as such between the UK and the EU, but require assurance from UK towards the EU about the implementation. So, in particular, that's the sort of customs processes that will be required, the need for goods regulation and associated compliance with that, uh, and then VAT. Similarly to the import declarations issue, we're, we're acutely aware that sort of levels of preparedness across those three themes uh, is particularly low. Um, so there is a uh, an urgent need for more guidance um, from the UK for businesses here uh, to understand uh, what those trading arrangements will be and the steps that they need to take to, to prepare for them. So there is a, a clear role still uh, in this phase for UKG to provide that, that level of clarity. Uh, but I think also worth noting and recognising that the there's a role for the EU in this space, um, and I think uh, through the negotiations, our minister is seen to see more of the de-dramatisation and pragmatism uh, uh, language that we'd sort of seen from EU negotiators in the past, um, and see that better reflected uh, in the sort of like the, the technical documents in particular, but also in the the outcome of the negotiations uh, as we move forward. Um, Guidance and information is, is is one thing, and we're, we're keen for that to come as quickly as possible. The The next issue is what do businesses do with that and how do they prepare? Obviously, we are now into July. Um, there are six months left until the end of the transition period. Um, that is a, a limited amount of time for our businesses to adapt to any changes. So we're conscious that there will be a need to uh, support them um, uh, and adjust and adapt to these uh, new conditions. Um, so on the protocol side, there are, to, to, to summarise the, so like the activities that are taking place and continue to take place, I think there's sort of two broad categories of the work. First of all is that influencing and informing, so uh, looking to uh, ensure that decision makers understand the circumstances there as best as possible. Uh, and also to uh, ensure that the implementation of the protocol works in a way that suits Northern businesses. And then the second theme of work, which sort of I've covered in, in, in almost all those bullet points, is supporting businesses to prepare as best as possible. And that, that will characterise almost everything that we do over the next six months. Um, moving on to the, the, to like the next area of work and then into Victor's brief uh, onto migration policy. So the Migration Advisory Committee um, uh, launched a uh, consultation on the shortage occupation list that closed on the 24th of June. Uh, our minister has uh, sort of pro provided sort of inputs into that and, and continued to make the case that a UKG uh, migration policy needs to recognise the specific needs of the Northern Ireland economy and the Northern Ireland labour market. Uh, and, and we continue to make that case uh, through the MAC and also to Home Office. Uh, Wider developments are that we understand the Home Office will uh, reinitiate re stakeholder engagement on their points-based system. Uh, and then finally, on the migration aspect, um, you know, we are, are um, mindful of settled status uh, and the need for, you know, the, the, in, in economic terms, but also the, the wider sort of, uh, sort of community and social impacts is that people that have chosen to make Northern Ireland their home that they um, are able uh, and to go through the uh, settled status scheme. So the current figures are that there's almost 60,000 applicants of those living in Northern Ireland. While this continues to be a TO lead, um, it's a, it's an area that we are um, particularly interested in and, and keen to see as many of those, as I said, that choose to live and work here to um, uh, take up the settled status scheme uh, uh, and continue to sort of make Northern Ireland their home. Under the 
Next area of Victor's brief is the sort of what the, the future economic partnership, and this describes the wider UK EU negotiations. So you'll be aware that we are now into another round of negotiations. Um, key themes or key obstacles from those negotiations at this present time are sort of like the governance arrangements and level playing field issues that you will have picked up uh, through the media. I think there's a clear sense that um, both sides have set out their negotiating positions and there is some distance between them. So it's likely that a political intervention will be required to bridge those particular gaps. Uh, from our perspective, key issues that we're interested in are the uh, arrangements for state aid and clarity for uh, businesses and government about what that regime will be in Northern Ireland. Uh, on tradable services, uh, key issues within that negotiation brief will be uh, the uh, qualifications and the mutual recognition of those qualifications and also uh, arrangements for data uh, and particular data adequacy agreements. Uh, and then finally, turning to uh, our energy, um, while the single electricity market is a feature of the protocol, um, it is also uh, uh, dependent upon uh, GB SEM trading relationships, which uh, it, it is caught up in the, the wider UK EU negotiations. So uh, keen to see the issues for our energy guys so, uh, addressed um, as quickly as possible. Moving then into the so like the wider trade space, which is a so like international trade policy. Uh, this is a, a a busy and active area of work. There are now four simultaneous trade negotiations that the UK is engaged with. So you'll be aware that the um, US and Japan uh, negotiations have already kicked off. Um, Australian negotiations are due to launch next week. Uh, and then uh, the uh, UK New Zealand negotiations will follow shortly after that. So, um, you know, it's a, a busy area of work um, across all of those negotiations. We are um, uh, keen to press the importance or, or keen to double down on the UK's commitment that trade policy works for the whole of the UK. And that, that needs to include Northern Ireland. Um, and then from our perspective, that means, you know, looking at how these arrangements could impact and, be or, uh, and benefit our trade with GB, uh, the Republic of Ireland, uh, the rest of the EU, and also our third country trading partners. Um, separate, but related to this area is also free ports and just a, a very brief update in that, um, there is a consultation uh, on free ports in the UK, which is due to close on the 13th of July. So while this is led by colleagues in the Department of Finance, because um, they are the lead interlocutor with HM Treasury, uh, we're working very closely with them to understand how free ports may benefit the Northern Ireland economy and ensure that um, our contribution to that consultation and engagement with Treasury includes those uh, interests of uh, businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland. Um, Moving on to Mary's area, which uh, you know previously we've spoken about the legislation uh, and the concerns that we have just in the both the sheer volume of legislation and the amount of time that we have uh, available to, uh, to, to to progress that. You know, it, it is a significant challenge um, that we remain concerned about, uh, and we also are acutely aware of the you know, the vital role that you will play in, in scrutinising. Uh, that legislation. I think there's a challenge that we face in, the, in many cases, the amount of information that we're able to share with you and the, um, the amount of time that we're able to provide to give the committee um, to scrutinise the legislation uh, can be sort of driven by what's happening in UK government uh, and then uh, delays in Whitehall progressing its legislation has an immediate and damaging knock-on effect on our ability to um, inform you. Um, the minister's letter to the committee sort of set out uh, the current position that we have. Um, we're expecting there to be 15 statutory rules that will be required to go through the assembly uh, and then 17 statutory instruments, which will be required to obviously go through parliament. Um, now, that is a uh, an indicative assessment at this stage. Um, our experience from uh, the legislative changes that required for no deal suggests that that number might come down a little bit. Um, as decisions are made to group either SRs or SIs, um, but that's the current position. What we'd like to do is come back to you with more detail as quickly as possible on the timescales for them. Uh, so we're working 
Mary's team is working incredibly hard to try and close the gaps in information so we can give you something that looks similar to a critical path of each of the SIs and SRs uh, and, and more importantly, time scales included uh, within that path. Another sort of key area of Mary's work is operational readiness. So in the, the the previous sort of preparations, this would have been described as Operation Yellowhammer, uh, you know, ensuring that government services continue to operate uh, in a no deal. Uh, that work is now restarting uh, as we sort of near the end of the transition period and, and the exam question um, sort of being set um, with all departments is to ensure that our statutory services continue to function uh, uh, on the 1st of January. So there's a, you know, a, a whole government sort of uh, work program there, which is led within Northern Ireland from TEO, but also um, obviously deeply dependent upon activities that have been driven by cabinet office, um, uh, which is an important and pressing area of work. Uh, and then the, the, the final area that we wanted to, um, to provide you a brief update on is business readiness. Um, so I mentioned a couple of times, particularly at the start, uh, the challenge in relation to business readiness. And we have spoken before about this particular issue. Um, you know, we're conscious that uh, there is a limiting factor in that uh, we need to understand the training arrangements before businesses can properly prepare. Um, it is likely that that information will be come late in the day, um, but we're not, you know, we're, we're not going to sit around and wait for that to come. So there is activity that we're taking now to you know, help businesses uh, adapt. And I think that activity is being taken forward in the context of COVID. You know, as a department, we are very conscious of the need to support businesses um, and interventions that we make to strengthen the economy and support businesses to adapt to COVID also need to have the uh, the need to prepare and adapt for the protocol and wider Brexit changes. So we've been working with uh, our arms and bodies, so Invest Northern Ireland, Tourism NRI uh, and Intertrade at this stage to understand, you know, you know, given the levels of uncertainty, what, what can we do? Um, and so through the, uh, the monitoring process that, that was announced by the Minister of Finance yesterday, um, and working with our arms and bodies, we've looked at um, just under around £25 million worth of interventions, which is spread around just under £12 million of cap uh, resource, £3 million capital, and then £10 million of uh, uh, FTC, so financial transaction capital, uh, and developed a suite of interventions that can help um, improve businesses' operational processes, improve planning, uh, introduce new technologies, uh, and then look to strengthen supply chain resilience. Yeah, all of which, as I said, look to um, both support businesses, adapt to the new normal that is created by uh, to COVID-19, but also help them to prepare for uh, changes that are we expect to be coming down the line uh, as a result of principally the implementation of the protocol but also wider changes as a result of uh, um, EU exit negotiations now obviously that's not a um, a, a one-stop uh, or a single uh, and final intervention we'll continue to review the need to provide support for businesses that will become infinitely easier with more information becomes on stream uh, and more guidance becomes available about what the trading relationships are. I think the next milestone in terms of uh, uh, spending interventions will be uh, so like October monitoring and the, the autumn statement from the chancellor or autumn budget rather. So that's, um, that's a very sort of high level summary across the work of the, of the three divisions. It, with the, Myself and the the team would be very happy to take sort of questions either across any of that brief or if there's uh, issues that we've um, not covered in that presentation, um, very happy to pick them up if we've missed any issues. Well, no, thank you very much, Paul. Um, and um, I guess the since the the publishing of the command paper um, and you know the the commitments that were made in in it in relation to the the future arrangements. Um, it has been clear that there is that lack of detail underpinning all of that. Um, and over the past couple of weeks, we've seen um, a number of business organisations and some research continuing to highlight the concerns around the lack of information available to businesses to help them prepare. And obviously, you have 
outlined some of the work that is still going on around that. Um, that the, the EU still feels that there's insufficient progress in terms of the, um, the, the implementation of the protocol. Obviously, we, yesterday would have been the, the last day that an extension could have been called, but obviously we had seen you know, a couple of weeks ago the British government's intentions <laughs> clearly that they weren't going to, to do that. Um, and obviously there is really tight time frames now um, up until the, the end of the year to, to, um, to, let, you know, to get through the level of um, negotiation and detail and everything else that, that we need to see to properly implement the protocol and, and uh, conclude a, a future arrangement negotiation. Um, so that, that's a big challenge and I think you've outlined some of the, that in your um, briefing in terms of in the legislative framework that will need to be put in place and the burden that there is there um, and also that continuing lack of clarity for businesses to enable them to prepare. Um, so, you know, just maybe like to explore that in a wee bit more detail. Um, the, the, the planning for the, the legislative framework you have it says that you can come back to us with a wee bit more detail on that. That, that will be useful for, for us in terms of um, even understanding what needs to be done before the end of the year. And if you can maybe outline a, a wee bit of the types of um, uh, SRs and SIs that are coming down the track. Um, what, what those are going to include. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, at the moment, we're, uh, we're keen to come with you, to you with as much information as possible, and that, that's the, the, the task that Mary's team are currently working on, to, as I mentioned, to close the gaps where we currently don't have dates, particularly on the, the SIs where they've been laid uh, or been taken forward by Whitehall departments. Um, the Particularly, I guess the, the most sort of affected part of the department is our uh, on energy side. So the, the, the legislative requirements that sort of um, are necessary as a result of the protocol, including arrangements for the single electricity market, takes up the lion's share of the changes. But it's not exclusive to energy. There are other parts of the department that that are also affected, um, and we'd be happy to come and provide you with a list of those uh, sort of fifteen and seventeen respectively. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, a, a, a critical path as we see it uh, that, of the stages that are necessary to progress them in order that the legislative changes are made by the 1st of January. Mary, is there anything that you would like to add from the, the, the work that the team is taking forward? Do we have to ask them? No, Mary should be in there. Mary appears to have dropped oh. off. Have we lost Mary? Mary's connection. No, Mary's gone into the audience. Can we put Mary back there into the spotlight? Go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, Mary, did you hear me? Right. I, 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 I did hear you. Um, so, hopefully, you can hear, um, hopefully, see me at the moment. Um, the, the, both SRs and SIs, um, there is a lot in there that's to do with, um, as Paul has said, the, the single um, electricity market and energy. Um, an example of one of the, the SRs that has recently put through that the committee has been involved in is on the um, mutual recognition of professional qualifications. So quite a number of the SRs um, will um, uh, you know, then build on um, kind of new policies, whereas the SIs are, are about um, rectifying um, the legislation that is required just to let us leave. And indeed, there were elements of the mutual recognition of professional qualifications in that space as well. Um, we, we have uh, also um, a number of SRs on health and safety. For example, on chemicals and how to deal with the chemicals regime, and that's very actively in, in discussion at the minute uh, as to how that is handled, um, and also um, in terms of the uh, going through the assembly economic uh, business regulation, and a number of areas to be rectified, 
when we leave the EU and also a big dependency uh, on the protocol and the detail of the negotiations um, between the EU and the UK on all of that, you know, employment regulation and business regulation. Um, that's one that is quite difficult to pin down in terms of either content or timing at the moment. Um, but certainly we do press within our own department um, all of the different policy areas um, to pin down um, content, dates, timings, um, so that we can give you a critical path and involve you in those uh, as soon as we possibly can. Okay, thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, in terms of the the support for businesses, obviously we're, we're all very aware of the, the difficult economic circumstances that businesses are facing already with COVID and the impact that that has had um, and now having to prepare for whatever circumstances are going to be there at the end of the transition period. Um, and you have outlined, Paul, in yours about the interventions that are being put in place um, in terms of financial support type interventions, um, but in terms of the, the education or training um, resources that are being made available uh, to businesses, um, what, is, what does that look like? Obviously the HMRC have made available 50 million in training for British businesses. Um, are ours able to access that or is additional um, support being made available to businesses here? Um. I, it, Julia can pick up the, the HMRC point on um, uh, the evaluates of, of customs training. Um, I, I think the the key issue is that um, so we're ready um, to provide that level of intervention, you know, and with good experience through working with Invest and I and Intertrade Ireland in particular, and run up to No Deal, uh, and they they led an intensive program of education of. of uh, you know, Getting out there and speaking to as many businesses as possible. So there's, you know, we've a good feel of what needs to be done. The problem is that um, we need to be able to communicate with accuracy and clarity to businesses over what they're required to do. And at this stage, we're not able to do that. Uh, as, you know, I, I email the lesson in memory for a, a personal reflection of, of No Deal um, and the frustrations that uh, businesses felt as, as, as when government gets in front of a group of businesses, it's, it's incredibly important that they have something to say. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is that ongoing lack of clarity and businesses don't get the, you know, the information that they need, then frustration quite reasonably um, sort of surfaces very quickly. So I think they, you know, we're ready to go. There's a program that we can deliver and, you know, and in partnership with Invest and Intertrade pretty quickly, but we need to know the terms um, and, the, and the arrangements that businesses are going to have to adapt to. So, you know, particularly, you know, the, the, the pieces that I mentioned on customs, good regulation and VAT uh, are all significant gaps um, at, at currently that, w that we're not able to explain to businesses what the future will look like. Julia, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of the, um, uh, that piece? Yes, yeah, so just in terms of the question around HMRC, yes, I've clarified with HMRC that businesses here can access that funding. Um, of course, um, one of the reasons I, I asked that of HMRC is because we are in a different position to businesses in GB and our preparation will be is a little bit different in that... Um, the government has been a bit clearer about what will be required for businesses trading with the EU. So anyway, in broader terms, um, there's we know there's been quite a bit of customs training over the past few years, and that quite a bit of that continues at the moment. In that, um, speaking to the Chamber of Commerce or, or Chartered Accountants, there's a there's a, a constant level of demand, I suppose, about customs training. Invest and Intertrade both continue to have resources available. Um, whether online resources probably mostly at the moment or Brexit preparation grants, they're all continue to be available. But the real gap, people can do the customs training that's out there at the moment, but the next step in actually getting people prepared is having real clarity on what they will actually need to do. So the, the people who are in finance posts in businesses, they will have to prepare for VAT, they'll have to prepare for customs, you know, that would be a lot on its own when you think of the resources that businesses have and the 
and the maybe financial decisions that have had to be made very quickly over the last few years, that function in many companies will be under a lot of pressure. Um, and so we need to make it as easy as possible for those people. We need to have clarity on what they will need to do and support available to them. So although there's been a lot of training to date, the next step really requires information on exactly what they have to do. No, uh, yeah, I think that that's a point well made, that is the detail now that's needed to, to help support businesses through that next stage. Um, and Paul, Paul, you mentioned um, the kind of types of areas of work that you're that is still being done by the department and around the implementation, ensuring that, uh, sorry, the implementation of the protocol, ensuring that it suits business. Obviously, the engagement forum is an important part of that, and there has been some frustration with or uh, from business um, here that that engagement hasn't been um, as intense or as um, as required uh, as to, to actually make clear what what business um, needs so how is that being managed has is that being stepped up and um, are those who are um, leading on the negotiations in um, in Britain clear on the impact that it's going to have on business here? Uh, yeah, so just, just, just for clarity, uh, when, when you refer to the engagement forum, is that the, the, the engagement forum is chaired by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah well, obviously, as a, 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 a NIO lead, um, I think the, sort of the, the feedback businesses has, has been communicated to them. That's not, uh, we're not involved in that as such. So, um, and can't control the amount of information that's transmitted to them, unfortunately. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, the, from our perspective, and when our minister engages with her counterparts in in London, that that's you know the they're the primary points that, that are landed. And at official level, we continue to sort of make that understood. And uh, you know, the, our counterparts in Whitehall uh, certainly understand that. I think. Um, and, and are keen to present as much information as possible. Uh, the challenge that they face uh, is that this is part of a negotiation, uh, and the challenge with Brexit in its entirety is that uh, everything is everything is connected, uh, and the negotiations get tied up uh, uh, because of those interconnected issues. Um, uh, from our perspective, uh, you know, as quickly as possible, we need to cut through those and provide you know businesses with the information they need. So uh, both sides of the table, both the UK and the EU, uh, need to sort of bridge those gaps. You know, recognise the importance of this to the Northern Ireland economy and then the consequential impacts on everything. You know, every part of life here in Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, you know, reach those agreements and then communicate those arrangements to businesses and communities as quickly as possible, uh, and then make sure that there are support mechanisms in place that they can uh, you know uh, uh, take on board that information and uh, adapt their systems and processes uh, within the very short amount of time that's available no I, I appreciate that and I think you know it's, it's a very fr fair frustration that businesses will be feeling that it could be really late in the day before they have the detail that they need to properly prepare um, I'm going to open it up for some questions John O'Dowd Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. And I just want to return to the two subjects the Chair has raised as well, in terms of the amount of legislation and regulations that the Committee is going to have to deal with in, in the months ahead. Uh, can we be assured that the Committee will have sufficient time to scrutinise the legislation? Um, I note in other Committees there has been concerns raised around a number of LCMs that have come forward. Uh, statutory rules that have come forward, etc., which the committee simply hasn't had the time to properly scrutinise. And I would be concerned, given the impact of this legislation, that if the committee's not given proper time to scrutinise legislation, then there's always a danger that further down the road there may be flaws found in that legislation, unintended consequences of that legislation, or long term problems as a result of that legislation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to be um, clear, if I could just come in. Okay. So go ahead, Mary. Really, um, it's actually quite difficult to give that reassurance at the minute um, because of the scale of um, what's coming the committee's way. Um, I think working with um, our colleagues, um, it is likely that some pieces of um, legislation will be grouped 
um, with similar items, um, which hopefully will give the committee more time to scrutinise and to do their job properly. It's always at the forefront of our mind to facilitate. Mary. I think Mary is frozen. Oh. Paul, are you still? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I have to pick up. I, 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 Mary is probably going to go on to say that um, uh, some of the lines that we, we, we share your concerns, absolutely. I think the challenge is uh, basically that we are in a chain of information, uh, and so the, the necessary information on the implementation of the protocol is required before we can do the drafting. Uh, and then if it relates to SIs, then we're required, uh, you know, there's a requirement for Whitehall to share those SIs um, as soon as possible. Um, and, and both of those create time pressures on us as a department. Uh, and unfortunately, the consequences, they then roll through to the committee in the amount of time that you get to scrutinise. So we're, we're acutely aware of that and, and we'll work as hard as we possibly can to give you the most amount of time as possible uh, and be as transparent as uh, as we can in terms of what we're expecting to come down the line, when we expect to see it, and then as soon as it's available, we'll be sharing it with you. Well, I appreciate the fact that I know officials will do everything within their power to make sure that uh, the relevant legislation is in front of us. And a lot of this is outside your hands, but I do have serious concerns that we are going to end up uh, with hasty legislation, which we will regret at our leisure. Now, on another point, Paul, you had mentioned during your briefing that there, there was £25 million <coughs> secured for supporting businesses and business readiness. Um, could you give us a further details on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, um, would it be helpful if we provided you with a briefing note of the uh, interventions? Would that be better? No, or do, that or would that be useful, yes. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, effectively, the, the, the exam question we've set ourselves is that um, COVID is a, a, is a huge shock to the economy and we need to ensure businesses adapt to the new normal. As a department, as we intervene in the economy, it's essential that those interventions do two things, that they help businesses adapt, but also help them prepare for the protocol. What we don't want to see are interventions that are uh, made now, uh, but then are undone by any impacts of the protocol later down the line. So to to meet that value for money for tests, the interventions do those two things, support adaptation, uh, but also help to prepare. And we'd be more than happy to provide you with a note and then come back if there's some questions that you, you have on that note. Okay, thank you. That would be useful, thank you. Christopher. Thank you very much, and thank you for your presentation. Um, in your opening remarks, you made reference to free ports, and I think that the development of free ports in Northern Ireland could go a long way to helping us ease the bureaucratic burden um, upon our businesses. I'm just wondering, could you talk to the benefits of free ports and what the advantages would be of free ports in Northern Ireland? Uh, Victor, do you want to pick that one up? Do you, do you want me to come in? Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me okay? Yes, I can. That's good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have been working uh, closely with the Department of Finance, who is uh, leading this sort of uh, piece from a, a Northern Ireland executive uh, perspective, uh, reflecting the, the, the Treasury lead that there is in uh, in England, so um, you know our our job, I suppose, at the minute is looking at what the proposals are, assessing what they might mean uh, for N Northern Ireland, looking to how they could be crafted, and understanding how they could be crafted uh, to make sure benefits are realised uh, uh, for Northern Ireland. So there's, you know, the, at the core of all of this uh, is the concept of tariff inversion, so that you could bring in components into a free port uh, tariff free um, which may and uh, were they not being brought into a free port have to pay pretty significant tariffs mm -hmm. uh, they're then assembled into a product that can be brought out into the broader economy or exported at a much lower uh, tariff uh, because the finished product is uh, it just faces a lower tariff than components that go into it so there are uh, examples that are given to this uh, internationally, areas like 
raw chemicals uh, like um, uh, automotive, um, indeed agri, uh, where there is the potential for, agri for, for free ports to deliver, um, to deliver benefits. Um, the UK proposal is to wrap that up in a broader, attractive package around um, you know, tax incentives, incentives for innovation um, and all, all of those kind of things. So planning incentives as well. So uh, those are, those are that, that's the, the sort of the concept. Yeah. I think there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. We have, as part of this and working again with the EOF, been seeking to make sure our stakeholders have a, a voice and can raise the similar uh, questions and seeking clarification. So there was a, a really good set of engagement over the last uh, couple of weeks um, as part of the consultation process where quite a number of our stakeholders uh, were able to engage directly with the Treasury to raise questions, uh, uh, aspirations, concerns around all of this. Um, so I think, um, you know, there, there are, uh, you know, I think it's important to really explore this concept, hmm. understand it clearly, uh, and then look to how it can work in a Northern Ireland context uh, and, and deliver the kind of benefits we would want it to be able to deliver. In terms of the, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of the, the scale of uh, what the government of Westminster is talking about, um, I recall, I think it was in 2018, that uh, Tina McKenzie, in her capacity as policy chair of the FSB for Northern Ireland, suggested creating the making the entirety of Northern Ireland a free port. I'm just wondering: Are we talking here Belfast and Londonderry and the international airport designated as free ports, or are we talking something on a on a bigger scale than that? Certainly what's in the mix uh, at the minute is that these are located at or close to or around ports. There's, there's a concept uh, that has been put forward by, um, by UK government that there could be links between uh, free ports, so corridors and all of that kind of thing. Um, uh, but th the kind of scale that it would cover the, the totality of Northern Ireland um, is not uh, sort of on the table uh, uh, in, in terms of what we have seen uh, so far. I think there's there's question about how, and these are questions that our stakeholders have been asking as well, mm. how would this operate in the context of the protocol? Mm. Um, and, you know, certainly the, the, there is a, I think that the consultation from Treasury is pretty open about this. Uh, there needs to be control of goods entering and leaving free ports for customs purposes, uh, which requires uh, security, you know, to be uh, available checks and uh, all of that kind of thing. So uh, that's, I think that's geographically, therefore, that sort of um, points to having these in, in finite, you know, defined, uh, defined places. So a, a Belfast to London Derry corridor with the airport in between. <laughs> there's, there's a there's you could think of a lot of options within that couldn't you yes that's right thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah but Darren, can i just pick up on that obviously um there are concerns around free ports as well in terms of um, being linked to tax avoidance and, and tax evasion and criminal activity um and you mentioned there you know the types of checks um, that might be needed in an out of port. So, ha what kind of consideration is being given to all of that in the context of what is being proposed by the British government? Yeah, very much. Uh, these are questions that are being asked. So, I think the, the response that we are getting and that you know the, the Treasury have given our, our stakeholders is: look, this is a consultation. Um, we are open and listening to ideas about how this might uh, operate. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're certainly, they're, they are keen to avoid these becoming sort of, um, uh, and there's, you know, there are exact examples around the globe where free ports are used for tax evasion purposes. They're used to store valuable items of art or whatever else, jewelry. Um, and, um, you know, the, I, the, certainly at the concept, the, the heart of this is something much more, um, 
uh, you know, production based, uh, that it actually leads to value added activity. Um, but there's still a lot of flesh to be put uh, on the bones uh, uh, to all of this. I mean, another issue that um, we have, you know, have been raising and no doubt will will continue to raise is just the the, the issue around displacement. Um, you know, if there is the you know the the opportunity in this is that it brings new activity into Northern Ireland, activity that we wouldn't otherwise get, and that it drives it helps you know drive a broader strategy of economic growth. Um, what is I suppose a fear that we would want to avoid is that what it actually does is draw in activity that is already in Northern Ireland or would already be in Northern Ireland and uh, draws it out of other locations and into a free port. Uh, I think th that, that is something that would, you know, it's, it's the former rather than the latter that we would want these to, to deliver for us. Um, and also how it would interact with the protocol, for example, in relation to state aid could potentially be difficult as well. Um, and the commitments, I suppose, that well, in terms of the protocol, you know, one of the main driving forces towards that was the avoidance of any hard border on the island of Ireland. So, you know, what kind of security be, would be required around a free port area on the land as well? Yeah, and I think that's that's absolutely uh, right, Chair, that, um, you know, this is sort of a microcosm, you know, of the broader issues that need to be and are being explored as part of the protocol. Um, and you know how the offer um, that is being put out by UK government can um, you know manage the complexities of all of that. Uh, you've mentioned some of them there. I think that's that's a really important dimension as this goes into further design. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for your presentation so far. Um, it's probably the same as, as other members have said. Uh, we as a committee are very concerned about the volume uh, and quantity of, of work to be done in such a short time frame, uh, particularly around legislation, but also around scrutiny. Um, yesterday we had the Environment Bill and, and really there was more questions than answers uh, in relation to actually giving uh, legis legislative consent um, to, to that from the devolved parliaments. Um, so we, we, we expect more of that coming through uh, and more frustration. And, and I suppose uh, we had a meeting with the House of Lords yesterday and they too within the, the, the parliament um, are having difficulty around scrutiny um, of um, the various components um, of our transition and our exit. So that, that is a, a major concern um, for all of us. Uh, we're kind of running out of road and um, our businesses are extremely frustrated in relation to the lack of clarity of where the land and space is going to be and um, and that's difficult for them to prepare. You know, everybody's talking about, you know, training and preparing and certs of origins and customs, and, but none of us know exactly what any of those requirements are going to be. So it's like, you know, going on your holidays, as I said yesterday, and told to pack your bag, but you don't know where you're going. Um, and you don't know what they bring. So um, it's really, really difficult. But one of the things that I probably want to, to, to ask, Paul, is um, Northern Ireland been outside the EU free trade agreements and having an uncertain situation regarding the UK trade agreements. Have you progressed that any further? Are we... Uh, can we give any more clarity to what our particular unique situation is in that space? And um, should we be having more emphasis um, uh, as an economy, you know, uh, and this committee to, to explore ways of maybe uh, looking at higher end services as, as opposed to developing higher end services as opposed to um, uh, trying to deal with the manufacturing aspect if we're going to be damaged by it. Have you given any consideration to just where we are in that space at the moment? Yeah, so, uh, I'll start and if, if you just pick up the detail on the research that we're doing. Um, and so the command paper uh, repeats the commitment 
of uh, UK government that no line can access the benefits of the UK trade policy and that sort of, um, that continues to frame our minister's engagement with her counterparts in the Department of International Trade, uh, you know, actually seeing the detail of that, of, of how our businesses can access those trade deals. So that's um, the first first part of that question is uh, NI's access to UK trade policy. There's a second part of your question that referred to EU FTAs and, and Victor can talk to us through research we're doing about um, uh, components and raw materials that um, start here uh, are moved south for processing and then exported across the world uh, and sometimes under EU FTAs. Uh, and, and we're trying to uh, to paint a picture of how important that is for our economy uh, and then put that to the decision makers and, and Victor can pick up that detail. Uh, and then in, t in terms of the what does the future economy look like, um, so that we, as a, as a department, we published the um, Rebuilding a Stronger Economy paper um, uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, a, a, and that talked to areas of strength where we, um, you know, uh, in the Northern Ireland economy, which includes um, sort of th those, those big data was how we described it. And, that, and that's absolutely sort of, um, sort of part of the economy where, where, we're, where we're looking to grow. Uh, but also thinking of... Um, uh, it also includes that life sciences and advanced manufacturing because that they, they, they are existing strengths. So I, I think, notwithstanding the uncertainty that those sectors face, I think given the you know, they compete on a global stage already, so we need to be able to find a way to support them, uh, them businesses uh, in, into that sort of post-transition period world. Uh, Victor, do you want do you want to pick up on the uh, the research that we're doing at this stage about that? And I content moving south, uh, and then the links to uh, negotiations on accumulation in the UK FDA. Yeah, of course, uh, happy to do that, uh, Paul. And um, certainly, I mean, this is a point that is uh, very much in our focus. Just that link that we uh, have uh, in terms of supply chains. Uh, manufacturers in Northern Ireland exporting into um, producers in the south uh, who then export through EU FTAs. So the, the, the issue around uh, what is on the table and, and the protocol at the minute, while we have conti will continue to be able to sustain those exports into the south, into the EU under uh, the protocol, it does not give us um, the ability to export through EU uh, FTAs as if Northern Ireland was EU content. Uh, and therefore, um, there is a danger that certain products could start getting frozen out of supply chain linkages uh, into the south, into the EU. Um, so we're doing research uh, to uh, examine what sectors uh, are, are particularly exposed and all of that and what you know what countries of export are are, are we would we be starting to to lose uh, access to uh, through that um, dairy stands out um, and we'll bring that work to you whenever it reaches a conclusion and we're, we're in the final state you know we're, we're reaching the final stages of that so that's uh, that's that, 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 that's a good place to be but certainly you know initial uh, initial uh, findings, and this is reflected also by voices from uh, the sectors themselves. Dairy is, has, has a degree of exposure to all of this, um, uh, and uh, you know there there is therefore a real desire to make sure that the relationship that the UK has with the EU will help mitigate the risks um, for dairy and for others that are, are exposed. Uh, beverages have a have an issue in this uh, it, it, from this perspective as well. Uh, Paul, you mentioned accumulation. So this is the ability to treat um, uh, product from the UK as if it were EU product uh, for the purposes of export to countries where both the UK and the EU have an F, have a trading relationship. Now that accumulation requires the third country mm -hmm. to agree to that accumulation. So it's a tripartite type uh, piece uh, to it. Uh, but in the first instance to unlock it, we really need the UK um, to agree strong um, uh, broad rules of accumulation 
uh, with the EU. They've asked for that, so that's certainly very clearly uh, identified in the legal text that was published by the UK. Um, the issue is Brussels are, have a concern that until broader issues around level playing field governance are resolved, um, they, they are less inclined to engage on this issue. So I think um, from our perspective, we just need to make sure that that kind of evidence and work is played into Whitehall to make sure they're aware of the risks for Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, sectors. Uh, and. Um, uh, you know that that kind of issue isn't traded away as seen as remains as a priority in the negotiation piece for for uh, for the UK government. Thank you for that. Um, just another well, quick question. None of these are quick questions because they're all so complex. <laughs> but in relation to scrutiny for the international trade agreements, because I, I'm aware that you know they could have an adverse effect again um, on our economy. Um, and our particular economy here in Northern Ireland, maybe agri-food, or for example, if the New Zealand uh, international trade agreements um, included lamb or beef or whatever. Um, so uh, how, how can this committee be sure that there is adequate scrutiny happening um, for Northern Ireland's particular position um, on these agreements? <laughs> We have been, I suppose, a very strong um, ambition in all of this is to make sure that there are heavy, there is heavy scrutiny applied to the UK's new trade policy, and that has been, you know, there have been strong commitments made in this by UK government. There, um, they have said that UK trade policy must work for all parts of the UK. Um, we've been building relationships both at ministerial and at official level. Um, so I sit, for instance, on uh, a senior officials group on international trade with Scottish and Welsh counterparts. Our minister uh, uh, sits on the ministerial forum for, for trade uh, with um, uh, uh, with uh, DIT, chaired by DIT, um, and you know we're pushing them to extend the envelope in all of that to make sure we do have a a role and an ability to play in um, you know our interests uh, in all of this. Um, uh, so I I think that you know remains important, um, and uh, in in terms of a. Uh, you know, a role for uh, the committee. I think we we need to, as these things uh, develop, uh, make sure that we're sharing that kind of information uh, with you, so that you have the the ability to scrutinise it. I mean, these things are remain in the reserved. Uh, you know, they 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 are not in the devolved space. So we're doing this through, um, uh, you know. Uh, seeking to make sure we hold the UK to its ambition of making sure this works for all parts of the UK and making the case that that cannot be done unless there is a really strong voice for Northern Ireland. And that's all stakeholders, political, um, you know, uh, consumers, uh, producers, all, all of those kind of issues need to be need to be heavily played into this. Thank you. And we have a very strong voice. The problem is the UK hasn't listened to it at, at any stage. And we have fall, fallen victim um, of, of the fact that we've been ignored every step of the way. And we are where we are today. And we were told that there was going to be no water down the IRC. And, and now we're looking at infrastructure and, and pre pretty heavy infrastructure too um, in, in our ports and, and um, in both directions. Um, East, West, West, East. So I am pretty sceptical about any promises made uh, and any declarations. They'll suit themselves. Um, but we have to keep on top of it um, as much as we can. Thank you. Um, Gary? Can we bring Gary into the spotlight? <laughs> can you hear us, Gary? Mute. Yeah, Are you muted? Mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I could hear you, but I wasn't too sure whether it was in the spotlight or not. But there you go, I'm in the spotlight. Um, <laughs> in, in, 
In terms of uh, the 25, I appreciate uh, and I would appreciate the seeing sight of the paper around the 25 million uh, intervention. Um, could you give us a brief breakdown as to, in regards to that 25 million, I just need clarity, was that solely in relation to COVID-19 or are you, or is it been looked at in terms of trying to kill two birds with one stone and, and bring the, the EU um, into it as well? No, absolutely. It's, it's, it's to do both. So the, the objective we set ourselves was to help businesses adapt to the new normal created by COVID-19, but also to make sure that those adaptations also help them prepare. So in our, um, there's an extensive exercise across uh, the three ALBs, the prioritization of schemes was on that basis, that, that, that on the basis to which interventions help businesses adapt, but also prepare. No, thanks for that, Paul, and uh, I look forward to seeing the paper. I think it is important that you know businesses can be as ready as they can given uh, the information that's available. But as COVID nineteen has taught us, um, you know we do live in a very fragile world. Uh, all of the plans that we put in place uh, sometimes they, they don't go to plan, so we have to be mindful that uh, that's ever changing. I, I'm mindful as well. Uh, Christopher, my colleague, had mentioned around the free ports issue. It's something that I have a particular interest in as well and I know that uh, some of the ports are given evidence today to the infrastructure committee uh, at Stormont and uh, and I think that they're raising some uh, genuine issues and one of the issues that has been raised by by Foilport or London Dairy Port is the fact that they are concerned that they do see opportunities uh, in terms of their position and uh, the fact that they, they straddle the border and uh, the fact that they operate on both sides of the border they are concerned of the potential of further red tape uh, being put in place, which could, I suppose, restrict some of the, those benefits. So how has that been looked at at the moment? And how do we ensure that what benefits we can have when we leave the EU, that they're maximised and they're not, that they're, there's not further red tape put in place, which will prevent uh, any growth in those areas? Victor, do you want to pick up, I guess, the, the, the question now is about um, an extension of the consultation and the, the feedback that we've had from stakeholders about the implementation of it? Yeah, I mean, I think it, um, it, it really it comes back to that point we, we, we discussed earlier, um, that we need to understand how that Freeport model that is being proposed and can, can be further designed to make sure that it can live um, and manage the complexities of the protocol uh, in, in all of this so that it uh, it's operable and um, uh, and delivers you know benefits uh, here uh, 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 you know uh, in the way that um, you know ports uh, producers, and all you know, other other uh, stakeholders want to see. So I think we're. Do we have answers to all of those questions at the minute? No, we don't. But we continue to ask them, and I think it's important that we use the consultation uh, a process to for our stakeholders to continue to ask them, and uh, for for uh, you know for us politically to continue to ask them. So there is further design to be put to this. Of course, there's further design to be put, uh, and. Oh, all to be uh, clarified. Those will be important, I think, in, in answering your question. Question about well, will there be additional red tape in Northern Ireland? Will there be issues that could curtail the, some of the benefits here? Um, I, I think we've got to continue to press on with that with uh, with the HMG and UK government. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, thank you for that. I suppose that you know the one bit of clarity that we do have in this last couple of days is the fact that. You know, the UK government aren't seeking an extension. Now, there will be people who will be happy at that. There will be others who are concerned at that, and, and everybody will have their view. Uh, is there is there time scales in relation to uh, some of these processes? Obviously, the Freeport issue is one. In terms of the time scales, we know uh, the consultation closed uh, 13th of July. Uh, is, there, is there a turnaround as to you know, when further detail will then be made available or when the findings, will there be a, a report or a summary published? How, how, will, how will we get a response on that? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, the the Freeport model, the actual implementation of it, and when it, you know when there would be announcements and all of that, that still is to be determined. It isn't necessarily linked or contingent upon. Um, you know the date of EU exit. Uh, the, you know the, the the end of this year. Uh, so that that timeline for uh, an announcement implementation is still still to be you know still to become clear. Um, and um, I mean there there is a, a sort of a expectation that you know, HMT will take away the, the responses that they get to the consultation will consider those carefully. Um, so I, I would expect that we will start to see some um, you know, uh, further, uh, whether announcements or um, you know, shape being put to this in the autumn. Yeah, no, no, I welcome that and I appreciate that they're not linked and I wasn't suggesting that, I suppose. What I was trying to get to is that many of those would see this as an opportunity and we need to ensure that those opportunities are brought forward as soon as possible. We're not in a position where uh, we, we have fully left uh, the European Union uh, and, um, you know, we, we don't have any of these measures in place. I think that we need to ensure that they're brought forward and they're dealt with as quickly as possible. But I do have confidence that, that as you've said, that they will bring that forward uh, when they have the findings. So thank you for that. Thanks, Gary. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, everyone, for your presentation. I think most of my points have been raised. Um, in relation to the common frameworks, I see we're going to get quite an excessive amount. Uh, we're talking... Uh, 63 apply to Wales, 107 to Scotland, 151 to Northern Ireland. So we're certainly going to have quite a, an overload, I would say, in relation to, to dealing with that. Uh, will a number of those um, frameworks apply to other areas, or are there that 151 specific to Northern Ireland? I think Mary's left us again. Uh, so that the common frameworks is uh, an issue that's dependent on... Oh, too far back, <laughs> uh, <that> Mary. <laughs> I keep disappearing. I keep disappearing. Sorry about that. Um, those, those 151 frameworks was the original list that we started out with, along with the, the other DAs. Um, that's now for DFE been brought down, I think, to about 29 that are of relevance to the department. Um, a lot of those, again, uh, on issues related to chemicals. Um, so although it's still only 29, um, some of them will require quite a lot of um, kind of policy work. Um, and and obviously the protocol, even when it comes to frameworks, the protocol is relevant um, because the other DAs are also involved in putting together frameworks. A lot of them will not be legislation, so it won't have to go through actually the whole process. Um, they will be um, enacted through um, more informal agreements, memorandum of understanding, for example, and then just cross uh, um, agreements between the DAs and, uh, you know, as part of the UK. So I think we're less worried about frameworks, although obviously it is another set of work that we have to get through. Okay, and just the, the point about, I suppose, the readiness of business for, for change. I suppose they're quite battle-weary, a lot of businesses, uh, over COVID, and it's had, taken, had a terrible... Yeah. You know, it's taken a terrible hit, yeah. and I think the implications of, of it will be with us for some period of time. Uh, and the businesses here, as I've said before, are quite used to regulation, you know, documentation, uh, certification, certificates of compliance, and so on. Do you feel that there will be a lot of additional burden on them as a result of this, or is it? In many cases, going to be business as usual, but with with a few extras. Um, I I think that's so. In, in terms of across the piece, I think that very much depends on uh, the type of business we're talking about and the trade that they're currently involved in. 
uh, and then the trade that they'll be going doing in, into the future, it, it won't be a, a one size fits all by any stretch. I think certainly uh, for our business population that are already engaged in sort of trades uh, outside of Northern Ireland and particularly outside of the EU, um, uh, and, and, and of that population, those that which, which are large businesses with the resources, um, I, I, when we speak to stakeholders, you know, they, they demonstrate a level of confidence that they will be able to adapt to any new trading arrangements. The, the concern would be concentrated in those smaller businesses that just trade within these islands that um, up to now haven't had to do any of these processes. Um, and, uh, you know, Throughout this conversation, we've mentioned that the, the nature and scale of them processes remain uncertain. So we don't yet know exactly what they'll have to do. And you know, useful that UK government has explained that import declarations are required for businesses that are purchasing from GB. That will be a new requirement. Businesses won't have had to do that before, uh, particularly if they've never traded um, outside of the EU before. So that that will be something they need to adjust and adapt to. And we need to understand if there are other um, sort of customs related processes, good regulations or VAT processes that will sit on top of that. So unfortunately, that there isn't a, a clear answer to your question, Mr. Dunn. Okay. Obviously, it's important that, uh, you know, support is, is given to businesses and we, you know, we're aware of the, of the efforts of Intertrade, for example, who have addressed this Invest NIA, I take it our are stepping up to it. I'm aware that they have done some work on it, but something I suppose as a committee we should maybe look at a bit more closely about the support that's, that's out there for businesses and the potential support. And unfortunately, we've been so overloaded by COVID that we've we've lost the focus on it. But I think it is important that we we do continue to monitor that and make sure that businesses, small and large, are are getting the right support and advice because it's and very much. A bit of a, a notion they're going into here, and, and uh, people are not sure about how it's going to, to develop and the, all the implications of it. So, I think it's important that we all work together to try and support business on the way through. So, thanks very much, Chair, for uh, thanks everyone for your contribution. John, Dad. Well, um, thank you uh, for all the information thus far and the patience with the questions. Um, the, the, the word risk has been uh, used numerous times today. Uh, the department will have a risk register. So I'm just wondering in terms of, of that risk register, uh, is there reference to the risk to the continuity of departmental business, to the risk that uh, legislation may not be properly scrutinised or time scales, you may not be using these exact terms, but certainly uh, uh, the risk to legislative processes and also the risk to the economy as a result of the process we're go currently going through. Are they on the risk register? Maybe not in those terms, but certainly reference to it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so I guess uh, our governance and accountability arrangements operate on two levels. That there is, a, uh, as a department, obviously we report to our board and audit and risk committee. Uh, that, that our business plan was published. The risk register has been updated, particularly in the light of COVID, but that's there. And then I, I think there's a, a second level which we operate, which is executive wide. So through the uh, EU Future Program Board, which includes the risk register. And legislation um, is near the top of that, and it, it's uh, a key concern across the NICS, uh, and, and that's reflected. And, and also, the, the, the lack of uh, the, the uncertainty that we're currently facing into the, the time available for businesses to prepare and the potential impacts uh, on businesses, uh, that then compounded with the, uh, you know, the, the the, the current conditions and the, the, the damage that has been done to the economy by COVID-19 up to this stage uh, and expectations that that damage will worsen uh, in the coming weeks and months uh, is a key concern for us. Well, uh, a more, of course, COVID-19 should be on your risk register. Is Brexit on your risk register? Yeah. Well, will it be possible to have a copy of your risk register? Registers? Uh, yeah, well, after, I think we publish it as a, as a matter of course. I know it's been updated at the moment. If, if, would, would the committee be content if we checked with our uh, corporate services and came back to you on that? Yes, appreciate that. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks, John. Sinead? Yeah. Just a, a question. Um, in relation to Article 8, um, around um, the, the VAT and excise rules, I know this is something that is really exercising businesses at the moment because they just don't know how it is going to operate. Uh, and uh, another area that they need clarity in. Um, do, do we know in practice how they're going to operate west, east, east, west, uh, and um, what what form will it take going forward? Um, I'll cover that one if you don't mind. Um, the short answer is no. We have um, we have very little information on what UK government is planning in terms of VAT and excise. I think the chair mentioned at the start of the um, meeting that you have a copy of the letter from. Um, which um, was their attempt to get some clarity and um, they got very little information back other than that um, HMRC would run the system in a, you know, taking account of Northern Ireland's position within the UK internal market. I met with chartered accountants yesterday. We really are aware this is an issue that if you look at other tax changes in terms of VAT or excise, you know, there's been years of preparation and even so, there's had to be years of extensions to allow businesses to make the necessary changes. Um, it, I suppose if you look at making tax digital, you know, that was a massive change for business. Mm -hmm. This is um, potentially much more significant. And yet we, well, businesses will have some time less than six months to make changes to systems. Um, Accountants told me yesterday some of those systems usually it's was a two year waiting period. It's um, I suppose there's no good answer to your question other than that it is an issue of real concern to us and we keep we keep raising it. But ultimately, I believe Treasury and the Commission are having discussions and um, Treasury are unable to disclose anything until those discussions have moved on, probably. Yeah, um, I mean, we are a very micro business economy uh, and for um, major operational issues, for example, that to change, um, it, it's not something that can be turned around quickly and that usually needs professional services to, to be involved in the process uh, and that requires a lot of money as well. So it is, it is something that businesses are concerned about and they have every right to be so. Okay. And Julie, can I just pick up on, on that point very briefly, is that in practical terms, um, can some sort of transition be put in place for businesses around that? Is that part of the discussion at all? It, we, we don't know what part of what the discussion is centred on, really. In practical, to, practically, you would expect something like that, and that it's going to be very, very difficult if everything was to be in place in six months' time. Um, even for you know those administrative changes, businesses will probably need some time. But I, I can't. Um, I don't know whether they are discussing a transition period or some sort of implementation, um, you know, say for six months or that, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Absent, absent any time to prepare, you businesses would need support in a big way, probably. Well, look, thank you all for your um, briefings today. They're, they're informative as always, and um, hopefully we will have you back soon as well with maybe a wee bit more clarity at some point. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to ask to bring Janine Maher into the spotlight, please. She is. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello. So we're moving on here to item number five, which is our oral briefing for money and pension services. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 45 of your pack. There is a briefing paper from money and pension service at page 48 and a letter from the service in relation to their rebuild plan for financial well-being in the north of page 69. 
and there is a briefing paper from the service in relation to the UK strategy for financial wellbeing at page 71. So um, welcome to the meeting, Janine. Um, and if you would like to make uh, an opening statement and then we'll open it up to members for questions. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this morning and share a wee bit more about the work of Money and Pension Service in Northern Ireland. So my um, short presentation will focus on three main areas. Firstly, who are MAPS um, and what is the UK strategy for financial wellbeing? Um, secondly, our sort of understanding of COVID-19 impacts on financial wellbeing in Northern Ireland. And thirdly, on our virtual round tables that we've had in Northern Ireland looking at how we um, look at a rebuild response to um, improve um, financial wellbeing in Northern Ireland. So I hope uh, to demonstrate to you today that the work of the UK strategy for financial wellbeing can very much complement the work um, of this committee and the minister in, in creating a, a recovery plan for Northern Ireland post COVID-19. Um, I'm really giving you that feedback from that extensive uh, engagement series that we had over the month of May. So um, I, you've got the briefing pack that we put together for you on MAPS, but just some headlines for you. MAPS itself was um, established by the Financial Guidance and Claims Act on the 1st of January 2019. Um, but we are continuing, as a new organisation, we are continuing um, work of uh, legacy bodies. And I myself have been in post in our legacy bodies for 13 years, delivering um, the work of financial capability into financial wellbeing in Northern Ireland. And our vision is um, helping people, everyone make the most of their money and pensions. As part of the legislation um, for the new body for money and pension service, uh, recognising the, the specific needs of each of the nations in the UK, um, MAPS was actually mandated to work closely with each devolved government. And we have a subcommittee of the MAPS board, which is just for um, devolved nation um, conversations where we share the development of the UK strategy and our corporate strategy. So we're really recognising the needs for each country. We work very closely with the Department for Communities um, and I was delighted that the Minister for Department for Communities agreed to co-sponsor the delivery plan for um, the UK strategy for Northern Ireland. So. We, although there's an overarching UK strategy, we will have a delivery plan to meet the needs for each nation and we're working really closely with the Department for Communities to develop that for Northern Ireland. Um, so MAPS itself has a, um, a lot of different uh, touch points in how we serve the community um, across the UK. We had uh, nearly 47 million hits to our website and visits to our website last year and um, use of our tools and we also syndicate quite a lot of content with other partners and in fact provide a lot of syndicated content to the NI Direct website to support um, the, the money tax and benefits section of NI Direct. And so far the coronavirus and your money content that we've developed has had over a million visits um, and I know we shared that with the, the assembly library um, to ensure that you have cited that and it can be used with your own constituents. We also um, have a number of projects that are based in Northern Ireland, um, four different Pathfinder projects, which I can speak to you a wee bit about later on. We have pension guiders here and we have our pensions operations centre in Bangor. Uh, so we have quite a lot of activity across the UK and um, addressing the specific needs for people in Northern Ireland. The strategy for financial um, well-being, uh, first of all, what is well-being? What is financial well-being? For us, this is about feeling secure and in control of your money. It's knowing that you can pay your bills um, and knowing that you can deal with the unexpected and that you're on track for a healthy future. But it's also knowing where to go for help and guidance um, and information when something happens and you know, we've often talked over the years about when the worst case scenario happens. Well, COVID has given a, a prime example of testing people's financial resilience um, and, and highlighting how much information people need when, when their financial resilience is tested. 
MAPS launched the strategy um, on the 1st of April 2020 and we had a, a webinar for Northern Ireland and a commitment that with that UK strategy that the delivery plan for Northern Ireland would meet both the needs of people in Northern Ireland and the policy context for Northern Ireland and we would work with our key partners in Northern Ireland to really address this. We know that financial wellbeing isn't something that MAPS can address on its own. This is very much about uh, driving forward a movement and a momentum over a 10-year strategy to address the key issues of financial well-being and, and support um, through our partner organisations to deliver that. The focus of the strategy has five measurable goals and the, what we are forming those around are what we're calling agendas for change. And these, these five areas that we wish to drive forward to change in we face from all of our research and our uh, history of doing this will have a significant impact in improving levels of financial well-being. So those five, five agendas, the first one being financial foundations. So this is around creating the right financial uh, um, education and ensuring that children and young people in Northern Ireland are having a meaningful financial education so that they're prepared for the world of work and per prepared to make those financial decisions. Through our legacy bodies, um, uh, I worked with uh, SIA over a number of years ago to embed financial capability in the school's curriculum in Northern Ireland. But this agenda for us is about driving forward how financial capability and financial education is delivered, providing the right support to teachers and using um, all of the work that the financial services do and fund to uh, create that momentum around that area. Second all is around a nation of savers, and this is around creating that resilience. Um, we know from our evidence the number of people in the UK, and particularly in Northern Ireland, who have low levels of savings. So when something happens, they do not have a savings buffer to rely on. The third one then is looking at credit counts, and this is around driving down the numbers of people in the UK who are using credit to um, get by to so using it for food and bills, not for luxury items, but using it for everyday items. And then the cost of buying everyday items on credit facilities means that item becomes much more expensive for them. The fourth one is better debt advice. Um, uh, debt advice is, was, as our legacy bodies, was something we were responsible for across the whole of the UK. In the new body, uh, the, the funding for debt advice was devolved to the Department for Communities. But we know from all of our research and commissioning over the years across the UK that for debt advice, um, very few people present for debt advice. And in, in fact, it's in Northern Ireland, only 29% of people have access to the debt advice they need. Um, and it's around getting people to debt advice earlier um, before they before they reach crisis and the debt uh, mountain becomes too big to climb. And the last one is then looking at future focus. So this is supporting people throughout their working life to understand and plan for their later lives. And also when they've reached later life, decisions uh, that need to be made in terms of drawing down in your pensions. So those are the five agendas for change that we're looking at. We also have cross-cutting themes within those agendas which affect all of them and those are around gender and looking at the particular implications for women in all of those areas. Secondly, around mental health because there's a there's a direct correlation between um, mental health and, and mental well-being and financial well-being. And lastly, looking at the workplace because we feel from all of our research and previous commissioning that the workplace is, is such an important avenue to reaching people and sharing that information and helping them make financial decisions. So those are our agendas. To meet these goals, um, as I said earlier, MAPS is very clear that this is something we need to do with the whole financial services sector, the advice sector and all people involved in consumer information and knowledge. We have brought together um, a team of 145 specialists that are committed um, to help set the milestones for the 10 year journey for each of those agendas. And we have representatives um, from across the UK and representatives from Northern Ireland on those UK challenge groups. And I was really delighted the Irish League of Credit Unions, a Young Enterprise, Advice and I, 
the Consumer Council, Mind and I and Copney have been very um, involved in shaping at a UK level what the recommendations are for a 10 year level. And then drawing down on that, we've had our series of round tables and a, a wide group of stakeholders to help us deliver and, and develop the, the delivery plan for Northern Ireland. So in terms of what we know and what we've heard um, about the impact on financial wellbeing in Northern Ireland, we already knew that pre-COVID, um, the financial wellbeing status in Northern Ireland probably meant we were in a worse position should something come. We already knew that of our, of our segmentation, 49% of people in Northern Ireland fall into the struggling and squeeze categories. And only, only around 254,000 of those save on a regular basis. So in terms of having that saving, savings buffer to cope with an income shock, fewer people in Northern Ireland have that than any other part of the UK. We also know that people in Northern Ireland are more likely, 11% of people in Northern Ireland use credit for food and bills, which is higher than any other part of the UK. We know that 61% of people in Northern Ireland don't feel they know enough to plan for their later life. And only half of our young people report having a meaningful financial education. And only 29%, as I said earlier, have access to the dead advice they need. We also know for Northern Ireland that one in four workers have lost sleep and money worries um, and poor, poor financial well-being is having impact on, the, on their work life. And this is all pre-COVID. So w a lot of the conversations that we've had with our stakeholders very much focusing on pre-COVID, it wasn't great. And then we know that there are going to be impacts on working lives and how people are managing their money going forward. Um, a lot of our conversations are focused on mortgage forbearance and a lot of the inactivity and the government support measures are staying um, any sort of crisis point coming. But while those interventions are there, people are not really feeling the true impact just yet. But a lot of the people we talk, spoke to in our round table saying what might come when those forbearance measures end um, and when the government support packages end. So what MAPS are doing about it and what we are doing to address that and support people uh, as, as we're going forward. Coronavirus has presented us all in Northern Ireland with a changed working environment and, um, and really changed what we anticipated the, um, the UK strategy would look like. Um, and it's, there's no doubt that the current economic forecast will have an impact on some of the measures that we were going to put in place at the, at the start of the strategy. So in recognition of that, what we are doing, um, although it's a 10 year strategy, we have decided to have a rebuild response the focus on from uh, from now until 2021, um, looking at getting people back onto a level playing field, um, because the starting position that we started with is going to be worse. So we're focusing on by the end of 2021, how do we get people back to where they originally started from, as we look to rebuild and then improve and um, look to the 10 year strategy to improve the general well-being in, in Northern Ireland. To help us do that and understand what people in Northern Ireland are feeling, we had a series of roundtables across the month of May. Um, and you know the, the modern technology that we're all used, getting used to now and having the video conferences has really facilitated a much broader conversation. Um, and we had these series of virtual roundtables with 100 attendees from 40 different uh, external bodies. Um, and what we looked at were each of those agendas of change that I mentioned earlier and the cross-cutting themes. And we looked particularly at the immediate implications of COVID on these and uh, the longer term strategy, as well as what recommendations uh, people might have for, for now. And we shared a lot of that in your briefing pack and I'm happy to have some of those conversations with you later on or at a later date, should you wish to. Um, so I just want to finish up and conscious you've had a long morning. I just want to thank you for your time um, and i um, happy to take any questions you might have about how we can work with you really addressing the, the, the need of financial well-being in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. She must be watching the media. No, I did that. Jeanine.
actually we're getting feedback if you're watching the um the live feed if you can just mute that because we're getting some feedback sounds okay now yeah, can you hear me still okay i can hear you yes thanks that's great thank you um no i i think all of us will um, be very aware of the, the impact that you know finances can have on individuals and it would be absolutely no surprise that people lose sleep and have poor mental health um, due to financial stress um, and obviously that's a real concern uh, at the minute you know with with covid and the potential um, impact in, in the, the months ahead um, obviously any kind of financial well-being strategy um, and in particular here in the north, there you know the, there's obviously structural issues. Um, you know we have like over a quarter of workers who are earning below the living wage. We have a high level of economic inactivity, um, relatively speaking, and you know those are issues that would need to be taken into account in terms of the, the strategy. Um, so I was just wondering how that all plays into it, um, and also in terms of. Um, you, you mentioned the kind of collaboration between um, financial services and advice sectors and, and everybody else in terms of this, um, the role of regulation um, and the likes of and, and you know the types of payday loans and you know that really high cost credit uh, is that being factored in as well? Yes, it is. Um, one of, as one of our legacy bodies, we came from the regulator, so we came from the FSA. Um, and you know, as, as time has gone on, we um, have expanded and are grew beyond the FSA. So we have a very close relationship with the, um, the FCA now, the Financial Conduct, um, and obviously um, Treasury and DWP as well. So over the years, this is, this is the fourth financial capability uh, stroke um, wellbeing strategy that I've worked on. But very much what we are focusing on this time is not just how do we address this and how do we work together? But what are the structural barriers that impact on somebody's ability to, to have financial well-being? So within our recommendations that are coming forward in the rebuild, you will see that there are structural recommendations in terms of what financial services can do um, and, and, and issues like that. And I'm very willing to share that's due to be published over the summer. And I'm very willing to share that with you when, it, when it's produced. But there are structural um, regulatory recommend recommendations as well. Okay, well, that, that's really helpful. Um, I that would be good to see. Um, Gary, we'll bring you into the spotlight. Thanks, Chair, um, and thanks, Janine, for that. Um, obviously, we all have a particular interest in this, given the fact that it affects uh, people right across our communities, our neighbours and, and, and including ourselves at many occasions and, and that you know these issues do affect uh, us over the course of our lifetime. Uh, in terms of the education piece, I do think it is important that we uh, ensure that you know these financial issues are brought through your education system. You know, I can only speak for myself and uh, when I attended school it's not that long ago. Uh, there, there, there wasn't a huge amount of uh, information, whether it be in terms of um, you know, savings, borrowing, mortgages, credit ratings, you know, what you needed to do uh, to do the right thing and to not leave yourself in a position where, you know, you've you've huge amount of debts. And I think that it's something that we need to need to focus on. So I just wanted maybe to hear, Janine, how maybe you're working with the education system here in Northern Ireland to try and bring about that change and mm -hmm. ensure that young people can uh, get the best possible education that will set them up in terms of real life experiences. Okay, thank you. Um, so we work very closely with SIA and a number of years ago we funded SIA to have um, a primary and a post-primary financial capability manager and their role was to embed financial capability within the school's curriculum. Um, I myself have two teenage children so I'm, I'm looking for it in the work that they do. It's very much embedded in um, learning for life and work. Um, um, and if you look at the, the if, if you have children or GCSE age, you will see quite a lot of reference to it in learning for life and work. And throughout the primary curriculum, it's there. I think, you know, having it in the curriculum is such a good thing. And we were the first, we we're the only part of the United Kingdom to have financial capability as a compulsory um, component of our curriculum. So we are ahead of the game there. I think what's our next ambition is to support teachers in, in the delivery of that um, 
because just because it's in the curriculum doesn't mean we, we should expect teachers to be 100% be comfortable with that. One of the things I'm working on this year, um, uh, if you see Martin Lewis on the TV, every time he's on the TV, he has a book behind him, which is his Young Money book. Um, so at the moment, Martin, with Young Enterprise Northern Ireland and, and MAPS, or myself and Martin Lewis, we are rewriting that book for Northern Ireland. So we have had a series of focus groups with young people about how we take that textbook and make it um, make it something that young people here will recognise, the language, the things that they're talking about. And that textbook will be delivered to all schools in Northern Ireland, as well as a teacher guide So we're and online content, because obviously we're recognising the teaching environment is different as well. So we're trying to respond to the need and provide content and supporting material that uh, is, is useful in the Northern Irish context. Well, that's fantastic to hear. And I, I do I, I do follow Martin Morris's stuff. There's some useful information on there, uh, not only in terms of, as you say, from a, from a young person's perspective, but for all of us, you know, we, we're, we all, uh, there's new technologies coming out and we, we have to keep on top of all that. But what I do find is that it's those who are most vulnerable that are often caught by some of the most dangerous loans and the chair talked about payday loans and then so dangerous and the fact that absolutely it may get someone out of a very short term issue but the long term impact of that in terms of the financial well-being but their mental health is quite severe uh, so well, thanks for that and hopefully we can hear from you again in the future and, and obviously you're doing really uh, strong and fantastic work and uh, I, I do want to thank you as well in terms of your organization for the services that you do provide to our constituencies as well because mm -hmm often we get through our assembly offices, people who are in real despair, um, and at least we know where to signpost them to if there are issues that are raised. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, something you're probably all going to receive, hopefully today, if not tomorrow, we've launched a new tool in response to COVID called um, a Money Navigator. And this is very much recognising the fact that although we're all in the same storm, we're not in the same boat, so we're not going to have the same journey and how we are coping with our finances. So the Money Navigator tool is, is uh, in that space between money advice and debt advice. So helping people move through on an online platform, getting the right advice and guidance to meet their needs. And if they need debt advice, taking them to where they need to go. So we're very much trying to support people through whatever their personal situation is. And that's being launched today. So. Uh, I will ensure you you get all get information through into your inboxes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Sinead. Okay. Thank you, Janine, for that. And I would echo um, Gary's gratitude um, to your organisation. Um, never was it more important at, at the moment. And, and some of the figures that you've said that about forty nine percent of working people in Northern Ireland fall into the struggling and squeeze categories, and that's pre COVID. So um, mm -hmm. that gives us uh, an indication of where we're going because the crisis hasn't actually hit crisis point yet. Um, mm -hmm. We're getting to it. Uh, we can see it. We can we can see it with um, the work that we do in, within our constituencies um, that there is a lot of people really really struggling. And I suppose if you if you think back to the film, uh, and it, I mean it's one of the most moving and horrific films that I've seen, is I am Daniel Blake and. Everybody can be Daniel Blake. You know, it doesn't take a massive crisis um, to actually be on your knees. You know, it could be a couple of pay packets uh, to your homeless or a couple of pay packets to you have no food. So I'm really, really conscious of that. And, uh, and Northern Ireland is expected to have a greater impact um, to the COVID in terms of the economy um, than, than any other um, nation within the United Kingdom. Uh, and you know, it's it's something we've we've high levels of debt here. We've very low levels of savings, uh, and traditionally we have low income. Our jobs don't pay as much um, in Northern Ireland as they do elsewhere. So it's something that we all have to be very mindful of. And and, and sometimes when we're talking about economic recovery, we're talking about you know businesses growing and did it. And of course, because that's how we get out of it. But you know, we really have to have some kind of mechanism where we actually catch people um, mm -hmm. you know and, and don't let them be destroyed 
uh, through this. Yeah. Now, and just in that there, I, I mean, you, you, you mentioned Martin Lewis, and honestly, I, I, he's one of my heroes. He's one of the people that I look at and I really admire because I think he does great work and he reaches out and he speaks at the level where people understand him. But one of the things that has been discussed quite a way, you know, through this here is the, the, the issue of universal basic income. What's your thoughts on that, Janine? You know, is it something that you as an organisation are, are discussing among um, other support mechanisms? Well, I suppose um, that's a policy decision that would come from central mm -hmm. government. What, what we tend to do and how we address these issues is looking at um, when policy decisions are made at, 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 at that level, we are the, we're the people that take that information and translate it into something that the ordinary person can understand because there's a lot of jargon particularly in financial services and there's a lot of um there's a lot of you know confusion caused by by terminology so our role is really to translate that into something that people can understand and how it, it relates to them well, obviously we have a very close relationship with Treasury and DWP, but um, we're, we're very much focusing on who uh, the universal support that we can provide and who can access our services. And I think that we're probably going to have to get into that area of policy going forward if, if, um, if the numbers and the figures um, are what we expect them to be from, from some of the economic forecasts. And you identified as well in your presentation that um, you know we're, we might all be in the same, but we're not all in the same boat. We might be in the same place, but we're not in the same boat. But you particularly mentioned women, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I see young people as well. Um, in relation to being more impacted because they are predominantly, I suppose, employed in those shutdown um, business sectors. Um, and, and, and that'll give rise to, you know, further economic inactivity. Um, have, you, have, have you given any um, consideration of just particular interventions to particular groups um, in relation to financial wellbeing? But, and we do have a number. Um, we do have a number of projects that are going now that are looking at particular groups. So we have um, a project with Read and Partnership, um, which is looking at particularly young people. It's a it's a youth transitions project. So it's looking at people that are transitioning from school to work or school onto universal credit and helping them with the decision making process they are at at that time. So that, that is one particular project and that, that is available online and I can send you the information about that. Um, and it's particularly aimed at young people because we know they are more impacted with their employment situation. Um, we also have um, uh, two other projects, one with NIACRO, which is a family support project. So it's trying to support the family and the implications on the on the children because we know your financial behaviours are influenced by your family um, and your family experience with money. So that family support one is looking at particularly vulnerable families. And then we have another project called um, Talk, Learn, Do, which is a train the trainer. Um, so people supporting families um, and how do we bring the the um, money guidance and how do we bring money conversations in because a lot of our experience and a lot of our research is telling us that money is the is the one subject that people do not want to talk about and it's particularly prevalent in Northern Ireland and even even in COVID it's still something that people won't talk about and still have this issue about sharing or talking about their money worries and fears so a lot of our interventions that we have, um, uh, we have four, in, and we've also got another one in Yuri, which is a local community partnership. A lot of those are trying to bring people to the sources of information that are already there and break down those barriers um, to engage with services because engagement is the big issue um, and um, normalizing the conversation so people will access the services they need. But in, in, ter in terms of targeting ones, we have that vulnerable support through NIACRO, the youth transitions through READ, and the local community partnership in URI, um, which is bringing together the credit union, the community advice centre, and the community partnership to, to create a community navigator to work with um, vulnerable people in that area. Well, thank you once again, Janine. Keep up the good work, uh, and there'll be plenty for you to do. <laughs> I think so. 
Thank you very much. Thanks, Sinead. Um, can we bring Claire into the spotlight, please? Uh, good morning, Janine. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I suppose that my question picks up um, a little bit on what the Deputy Chair was talking about in relation to, I suppose, debt management within uh, communities. There there have been a number of programmes across Northern Ireland where community and voluntary organisations have been providing a debt management service, which has been really useful because of the topic that, I suppose, mental burden of people knowing that, that there is uh, a pathway to, to finding themselves out of debt. My second uh, point I would raise, anecdotally, I'm noticing that to be able to apply for credit is getting much more difficult, mm -hmm. and it seems that interest rates are rising. And I suppose uh, if we're looking at debt management, maybe we're not able to apply for credit. But naturally, I think some people will turn toward that, and there will be an impact, particularly if our interest rates are uh, mm -hmm. in um, I think that's as a direct result of COVID-19 and the difficulties that we're seeing there. So I'm just keen to hear your thoughts on that second point and then also uh, in relation to the community and voluntary sector around supporting people who find themselves um, in debt and, and how they can find a pathway out of that. Thank you. So in terms of the community and voluntary sector, um, as, as I mentioned before, MAPS, we funded directly the debt advice services in Northern Ireland and then that was devolved down to DFC. Um, but we work very closely with them and in, in, a, in a COVID environment we have um, established a debt task force which is really bringing together both the voluntary community sector in Northern Ireland, DFC and all the debt charities across um, across the UK, so Step Change, Citizens Advice, all of those organisations because we're very much focused on how do we learn from each other's experiences, how do we share um, be better ways of working and share training, share all of that in terms of response. So that that's one of the ways in that debt de task force that we're um, bringing everybody together in a collab collaborative environment. Um, and that um, money navigator tool that I mentioned earlier, that was done in collaboration with all of those organizations to, to design a, a client journey that people would engage with. And because we know the debt advisors, have got more experience than any of us in terms of knowing what people respond to. Um, so we do work very closely for that. In terms of your uh, your response to asking about people applying for credit, we absolutely are seeing two sides of the coin. We're seeing some, some people are saving more at the moment because their spending has gone down. Conversely, depending on your employment situation, people are applying for credit. Um, and I really do think that we are not going to know how bad that is until forbearance and support measures end. Um, and it is something we're all just going to be, have to be mindful of. There is an affordable credit, credit element in that credit counts. Um, so some of the work that we're doing is looking at how we can support organisations um, to deliver uh, affordable credit for people who may not be able to access mainstream. Fair for All Credit uh, are, are chairing that group in the UK position um, and some of the recommendations they're making are how we can use the dormant account for money across GB um, to, to, provide, um, to provide that support for affordable credit. Uh, Fair for All are only funded for GB. I think the proportion of the dormant accounts has, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's with the Department of Economies. Um, so there may be a conversation to have at some point around how uh, I think it's gone to the lottery, um, but how we can use, how we can look at the learnings from affordable credit pilots in GB and uh, apply those to Northern Ireland. Okay, thanks. Is, is that essentially saying that we don't have any sort of safeguarding in relation to affordable credit and what people in Northern Ireland can apply for? Um, I suppose that's you know that that is something that I would certainly support that you know that we we can ensure that people if they're applying for a credit that they can't afford to pay it back so that they don't find themselves in a much more uh, uh, complicated situation. Um, I know that um, the Consumer Council for Northern Ireland have received some funding from Treasury um, to work on affordable credit and we are part of that and it's very much around who is who who can provide affordable credit uh, in Northern Ireland. And where that's part of our recommendations are on our rebuild document is accessing affordable credit in Northern Ireland and how people can do that. Mm, okay, so, great. And okay. Along, alongside that as well, one of our um, strategic things that we've done in, in the debt landscape is building in 
a savings element into somebody in the debt journey so that the standard financial statement which is used in a debt journey we've um, mandated savings into that so that people build a savings buffer even though they're in a debt situation so creating that savings habit make help you become more financially resilient in the longer term yeah no it's it's all it's all really makes sense and, and i think that's you know no, it's, it's about, I suppose, um, removing that debt, but then, you know, a longer term kind of approach to finances. Yeah. Um, there, just to pick up on the point around the, the dormant accounts and, and what exists in GB, um, it, could we get a, an update maybe from the Department for Communities um, around that work? And, and if that's something that, you know, we, we could look, look at here in Northern Ireland. The conference entry code you entered is invalid. Yeah, that's not good. Welcome to you. Okay. We're... We need to switch. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you're having a bad switching from one to another today. Yes. <laughs> so just bear okay. with this, this chair. The star leaf is about to end. Um, it ends at noon, and we're just switching into teleconferencing. Just putting an, an enormous amount of pressure on Tommy. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, Tommy. All right, Tommy. All right, Tommy. All right, Tommy. <laughs> Welcome to your conference. You enter your good. passcode, followed by hash. Once in your call, to hear a list of your conference controls, please press hash. Hey, um, we're now continuing in teleconference. Um, John? Yes, um, thank you. Um, in terms of our economy, our economy runs on the basis of, of certainly a large section in terms of debt. and. As we encourage people to go out and consume again, debt will rise, and I suspect some of the financial institutions will be uh, stepping up their uh, camp advertising campaigns about people taking on loans, credit cards, etc., etc. In terms of your engagements with the financial institutions, how do you find it? Are, are they taking on board the real dangers uh, that people falling into debt they can't afford uh, presents uh, to uh, themselves and also to the broader economy as well? Um, well, so we have a one of our challenge groups is each uh, one, and in all of the challenge groups, church financial services are very engaged in it, and it's been interesting to see how supportive they have been in um, developing um, customer journeys and, and getting people towards support. So, in, in debt advice, for example. Editor is more likely to know that someone is in, in difficulty than the, the advice sector. So we're one of the initiatives we're working on is how creditors can, can identify when they see one of their clients is in difficulty. They may not know what, what the cause of the difficulty is, but they're trying to and getting that person to the right support. Um, the, the money navigator to I mentioned earlier on, that's something that financial services will be using with their clients and customers and saying this is something that you should use. And um, so we are seeing a, a level of um, a good level of engagement with them and also in terms of, of financial education we're seeing a good level of engagement because financial services actually spend millions of pounds um, a year, per year on financial ed education intervention. So working with us and working with all of the key partners they're looking at how we can maximise the outcome um, and the outcome of creating uh, financial well-being and, and children and young people that are actually better informed and able to navigate and understand the financial services and the financial decisions that they need to make. Um. Can I just ask you a follow-up question? You may not, you may not have a, a relationship to this industry. Uh, in terms of gambling and online gambling, etc., uh, and, and the credit available through online gambling, is, is there any engagement between yourselves and the online gambling companies about uh, the debt some of their uh, patrons uh, end up in? Uh, not directly, but it did come up in one of our round tables. That, that was a uh, route to, to um, working with them and working with those organisations, but, but I don't directly, but it's interesting that it has come up in our conversations as a route to providing advice and guidance to people. Yeah, it's an area that I think has grown substantially over the, over the years, particularly with, with the access of online gambling now, and, and it's so easy for online gambling, but particularly I think in terms of its attraction to young people. Um, 
uh, I know just in terms of uh, some circles I would be in, you know, you'd be sitting on, on they're, they're, they're gambling on their, on their phones uh, during meal times, whatever it may be. And it's just a concern that given the rise of that, that uh, the debt that those young people will end up in. But so if there is an, an element for you to explore, I, I would encourage you to do so. Thank you. Thank you. presentation has been um, really helpful um, and I'm sure they'll be it will be useful if you could share the additional information when you have it as well um, and I'm sure we'll keep in touch as well thank you thank you thank you thank you for your time today thanks okay Peter Hi. chair we'll um, seek to find out who exactly is controlling the what one of the dormant accounts here because as Janine had said um, it's it's not a UK wide thing. It's done separately here. Um, it would just be useful to pin down how that worked, what happened, and so on. Also, if members are content, trying to find out a bit more about just exactly how online gambling credit availability is regulated. If it is, yeah, because that that's something I guess that is going to be a major issue now that things like that are so available, and plus with with. The, the whole pandemic and people being at home and, and those sort of things. So if members are content, we try and find out a bit more about just exactly how that works. Yep. Sure, you're probably aware there is an APG now on mm -hmm. gambling, uh, which I'm a member of. It hasn't met a couple of times, but you know they, they're starting to get themselves organised. So there are a lot of issues there that has been touched on, and certainly there will be further investigation. But any other efforts we can make, yeah, it's good that we, we try and do what we can to to find out more detail on it. Yeah. It's a huge issue. Um, and Peter, as well, I see in terms of the kind of structural issues that um, Janine was talking yeah. about, the, the likes of the low wages. Yeah. Obviously, there were a couple of things in New Decade, New Approach, around the devolution of minimum wages and also the banning of zero-hour contracts. Can we seek an update on those from the department? OK. Um, members, we are... We have a number of items, but we're going to roll them on to our next meeting because we're... We're, we're sound only at the minute, yeah. Chair, and it's not going anywhere. It's being recorded, but it's not going anywhere. So we're not being broadcast anymore. Going Through the Chair, just can I go back to... There was um, a paper, a briefing paper in there from the London Day Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be remiss of me not to um, speak to it. Um, the, in it, they're talking about lack of capacity within their business community uh, because of the COVID and, and the additional Brexit. They're talking about the cross-border workers. Uh, they're manufacturing the difficulties in their manufacturing supply chain, unfettered trade, investment uh, and business engagement. And it's the business engagement that uh, is critically important. They're talking about the Secretary of State's the, the business engagement forum in relation to Brexit and they are quite keen that their voice would be heard. So um, just from, from this committee, it's, it's they have a particular issue because of being a cross-border business representation body that 
perhaps business bodies or business organisations maybe based in Belfast won't have, uh, and yet their voice is, is not there in that engagement process. So I think it's important that they are heard. Chair, just on that, while the committee's been meeting, we've had a letter come in and we forward this to members um, in response to your letter to the um, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove. We've had a response from Penny uh, Mordaunt, who's the Paymaster mm -hmm. General, yeah. um, about the, the, the committee's concerns about the transition period and the, the engagement with business. She's indicated that um, there was a meeting of the business, business Engagement Forum on the 10th of June with the executive in attendance, and it will remain an important part of developing their approach in the weeks ahead. It doesn't really say much more than that. Okay. Um, but we'll have that circulated to members. That'll be in next week's pack. Cause there, there may need to be some follow up on that. Just exactly trying to find yes. out what happened. Yeah, and just to pick up on Sinead's point as well. Um, perhaps it would be worth writing to the um, Secretary of State mm. in relation to this, uh, and because NIO lead on the, the engagement forum. That if we can express the concerns that have been. Um, passed on to us by businesses and in particular those kind of cross-border concerns that are there as well. Um, Chair, members are content we'll go ahead and do that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Chair, what have we agreed on, on in relation to that London Dairy letter? Just to write to the, the Secretary of State about business engagement. Right, and is that across the country we're talking about or just... No, yeah, across yeah, and highlighting the, the cross-border issues that have been raised in respect of the Dairy Chamber, and I suppose it will be similar across the border. I'm sure it's similar for Newry Chamber as well. Chair, in the it will be a similar um, issue. papers we've had from a variety now of chambers, that's been one of the key things that's been put forward is the need for local engagement, executive level engagement, but engagement with UKG mm -hmm. um, to make sure that the voice is being heard, because as members heard today with the, the um, briefing from the EU exit officials, there's a lot going on at that level that the voice needs to be put into um, and, and it's not necessarily as, as, as clear to see what the negotiations are. And is this letter going to the department, Chair? Right, sure. Is this letter going the up Secretary to... Secretary of State. But it will be copied to the department. Oh. Yeah, to our, we to our minister. We do that as a courtesy. Yeah, yeah to the economy. Mm. Right, okay, thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Okay, so sure. we're going to move then to item number nine, which is... No. Yeah, the date, time and place of the next meeting, and it is next Wednesday at 8 or at 10 in the morning. 10, 10, <laughs> 10. Here. Thank you. Thank you. We're not moving. No, no. Your turn. Okay. Yep.